Oh, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to IPA for the invitation, which um, in the spirit of uh, agile and adapted governance turned out to be a little different from what we originally had intended. But um, one always has a high threshold for ambiguity working with the public sector and in the public sector. So, uh, so we'll wait um, Premier Weatherall's arrival with interest. Um, so can I begin, please, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Ghana people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to address the IPA National Conference. This is actually the 20th anniversary of the first conference I ever attended in Melbourne in 1996. It was a very ferocious affair for anybody who was there and remembers. Um, I was captivated by the ideas and issues uh, in, that were debated in that forum by practitioners and by academics, all of whom were very engaged in and deeply committed to public administration. And actually, it was career-changing for me in lots of ways. I'm sorry, this Madonna headpiece is giving me some trouble. Um, and it really motivated my decision to return to study and to pursue a career as an academic boundary spanner, as I like to think of myself as. Now, for reasons um, that I'll outline shortly, um, I'm just going to take it off. <laughs> It's driving me insane, it must be driving you insane. Um, for reasons that I'll outline shortly, I believe IPA has actually never been more important, not just to public servants, but to the health and well-being of Australia's system of governance. And I'm, for one, am very much looking forward to its return to my home state of Queensland. Now, those of you who are familiar with my research will know that I've written a lot about the growing professionalisation, adversarialism and hyper-partisanship of politics and its impact on the work of policy advising and governing for more than 15 years now. Much of this has been published in the um, Journal of the Institute of Public Administration, the Australian Journal of Public Administration, that along with conferences like this are a key member benefit. So I think you know, there's no disagreement that the, about the damage that's been wrought by the growing uh, tribalism and hyperpartisanship of Australian politics. Laura Tingle's quarterly essay, Political Amnesia, and her earlier one, Great Expectations, captured pretty well, I think, um, some of the drivers of political discontent in Australia and our system's apparent incapacity to respond to it. And like you, I'm very much looking forward to hearing Laura's take on the current state of federal politics when she addresses the conference dinner tonight. She's one of that very and increasingly rare breed in journalism, I think, someone who understands policy as well as politics. Uh, more recently, Peter Varghese's excellent valedictory speech highlighted the loss of capacity for deep policy thinking and the impact of successive, as he describes them, often evangelical efforts to transform the public service. It's my view that we've spent much too long focusing on the non-partisan side of the relationship between ministers and career officials, and we've given too little attention to the conduct of politics and the behaviour of the vastly expanded political class. Uh, and, by he and here I mean politicians, their staff, and the political parties that produce them. Now, this is an international problem. Despite having driven successive waves of public sector reform, ministers have been conspicuously, conspicuously absent from reviews and inquiries into the performance of the public sector. Despite the leadership role that they undoubtedly exercise, with support from and ideally in partnership with the public service. Now, legendary Mandarin Arthur Tang noted as much in his 1981 Garan oration, reflecting on the Royal Commission into Australian Government Administration, which specifically excluded ministers. Christopher Pollitt and Geert Booker, two scholars who will be very well known to people, I think, similarly argue the need to review ministers remaining the no-go zone of public service reform. And so it's high time, I think, that we focused on the demand side, on the elected side of the governing marriage. Uh, and despite the often heroic efforts of senior officials to manage the dilemmas and puzzles created by successive waves of reform, that's how we describe them in the literature, dilemmas and puzzles, uh, particularly the public management reforms, it's increasingly untenable, I think, to ignore the disregard that many members of the political class show for the rules of the game, the traditions and conventions that guide our system of governance. It's time, I think, to bell the cat on the consequences that the relentless blurring of the boundary between politics and administration has on outcomes for Australians. So I should probably explain how I've come to, uh, my, how my thinking about this current situation has evolved. I've done a lot of academic work in this area, as I've said, of course, and my teaching and research has me interfacing a lot with ministers, ministerial staffers and officials in the Commonwealth uh, and in subnational jurisdictions. Over time, the divergence between theory, how things are supposed to work, and the practice of executive governance and policy making, how they really do, 
has become increasingly pronounced. And so in 2014, in an effort to understand the chorus of lament that we thought was going on, Julianne Schultz uh, and I collaborated to co-edit an issue of Griffith Review that we titled Fixing the System. It was uh, FTS, as we call it, because of course you have acronyms, but so do we. Um, FTS was published in January 2016, and it includes essays and reportage from some of the country's best political analysts and thinkers, all of whom sought to come to terms in some way uh, with the question of what's wrong with our politics. Now, fixing the system attracted a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest. Our contributors have done lots of media and public events since it's released. This almost never happens to academics, so we're very excited. Um, and that confirmed to us that we'd struck a chord. The issue went to print in late November 2015, which seems a long time ago now, but just to remind you, this was when Malcolm Turnbull's popularity was at record highs following his successful defeat of Tony Abbott for the Prime Ministership in September before Donald Trump sees the Republican nomination to vote in the United, uh, to um, contest the presidential election, and well before the tumultuous Brexit campaign and vote in the United Kingdom blew our minds and made us all realise that we knew nothing about politics and couldn't predict it anymore. But it was after the bitter and divisive minority parliament of 2010 to 13, Tony Abbott had won a resounding election victory, but was really struggling to make the transition from campaigning to governing. One-term governments had been defeated in Victoria in November 2014 and in Queensland in January 2015. Volatility, the commentators asserted, was becoming the new normal. Now, the prevailing climate of political complexity and volatility is very familiar to IPA members. Its drivers have been extensively canvassed in some of the books and articles that I mentioned, in valedictory and other speeches going back to 2006, and of course, in an extensive international literature. Intellectually, we understand their impact and implications both for the business of governing and for relations between elected and unelected officials. What I don't think is yet clear is whether what we're witnessing and experiencing now represents a continuation of the forces of change that have reshaped our economy, our society and our politics over the last 25 years, or whether, like at other kind of critical junctures in history, um, the rise of populism and nativism represents a permanent disruption. And I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I will confess that I'm bored out of my mind in endlessly diagnosing and describing what ails our policy and political processes. I want to know what, if anything, can be done about it. Because I'm really worried that many of the institutions, principles and traditions that have underpinned Australia's uh, prosperity and social cohesion are at risk. I'm concerned we may be sleepwalking into a future that none of us wants. So I've been arguing, but obviously unsuccessfully for some time, uh, the need to shift the focus of debates about public sector reform from a primary focus on the public service to what needs to change about politics. Boldly, and in the interests of having more impact than my obviously too polite previous efforts, um, I want to name the political class as the elephant in the room uh, of the missing link of public sector reform. Now, understandably, a focus on politics makes public servants extremely nervous, as it should. Uh, academics have much more licence here, so let me use it. It's appropriate to do so, actually, at an IPA national conference, because IPA has always provided the platform for tough but necessary conversations about the continuing health and well-being of our institutions, our system and our processes of governance. So like the tough but necessary debates of the past, which I first witnessed in 1996, uh, which we can talk about over dinner tonight, I hope my remarks today might provoke a wider discussion both about what can be done and who should do it. My own view is that IPA, um, and including and perhaps especially its academic members, have a special responsibility to ensure the Australian community understands just what's at stake. And I particularly want to challenge, if I can, the prevailing view that nothing can be done. I think if you read Claire's, Claire Wright's essay in Fixing the System, you'll see that's simply not the case and never has been the Australian experience. Now, my own essay in Fixing the System is entitled Beyond the Nadir of Political Leadership. In it, I outline structural forces that I think are responsible for recent political failures and the persistent failure of the political class to learn from experience. Nothing in the period since, I have to say, has done anything to shake my conviction about the validity of my analysis, which is not intended to be arrogant, it's just kind of tedious how the things you predict come true. Um, briefly, my essay identifies structural factors at two levels that inhibit the capacity for learning by political partisans. Now, the first is in the pathway to attaining government, and this is, encompasses career backgrounds and experiences of political leaders. There are now many, many more numerous fellow travellers, 
the nature of opposition, and how transition of government, transitions of government are managed. And the second impediment, I think, is deeply embedded in the hybrid advisory model uh, that has evolved to support political leaders. It deprives them of institutional memory and the capacity to learn. At the same time, it enables, or at least it doesn't inhibit, a leader like Tony Abbott, Campbell Newman or Kevin Rudd from developing relatively insular and self-reinforcing networks of advice and support until inevitably the party room revolts, or the voters do. Recent experience encourages me to add a third structural factor that is or may be becoming intrinsic to contemporary politics. And this is the rise of careerists and extremists within political parties whose only raison d'etre is to gain and maintain power. Independent MP Tony Windsor often says, the world is run by those who turn up. Well, this group turns up consistently from when they entered student politics as teenagers. For many of them, it's not about values or a vision or the kind of nation, state or territory we want to build. Instead, it's about their tribe. Now, it might be too soon to assert this, uh, but I think the leader, the era of leader predominance, which sort of dominated debates in executive studies for about 20, uh, 20 years, uh, this notion of the presidentialization of politics, might actually have passed. How else to explain the constraints on, uh, and the, indeed the weakness of leaders like Malcolm Turnbull or David Cameron, whose primary opponents are internal? Winning an election, albeit narrowly in Turnbull's case, conferred none of the authority that might have been the case in the past. So reforming the political parties, pre-selection processes, and the extraordinary hollowing out of their capacity for ideas generation and policy development is the rational response, I think, to the fact that 22% of Australians voted for someone other than the major parties on July 2. But we know from bitter experience, and indeed from current pre-selection uh, wrangles on both sides, how stubbornly power brokers on both sides resist efforts to reform and democratise their parties. Now, the public service has no capacity to influence this, but it does need to understand its implications and the consequences for public administration. And for their part, I think journalists need to do more than record the battle to win the daily news cycle. They need to look deeper, and so do we as academics, despite the formidable disincentives, and I'm very happy to talk to you about this later, uh, to studying Australian politics, particularly at the state and territory level. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but the cover story of the July-August edition of The Atlantic magazine, How American Politics Went Insane by Jonathan Raunch, really captures brilliantly the dilemma inside political parties. It's sort of, a, it's a depressing, but it's weirdly compelling uh, meditation on the crisis of legitimacy in American politics right now. Let me share with you my favorite quote. In various ways, and this is in July, in various ways, Trump, Cruz, and Sanders are demonstrating a new principle. The political parties no longer have either intelligible boundaries or enforceable norms. And as a result, renegade political behavior pays. Trump, however, did not cause the chaos. The chaos caused Trump. What we are seeing is not a temporary spasm of chaos, but a chaos syndrome. Chaos syndrome Ronch says, is a chronic decline in the political system's capacity for self-organisation. It begins with the weakening of institutions and brokers and political parties and congressional politicians and leaders and committees that have historically held politicians accountable to one another and prevented everyone in the system for, from pursuing naked self-interest all the time. As these intermediaries' influence fades, politics, activists and voters all become more individualistic and unaccountable. The system atomizes. Chaos becomes the new normal, both in campaigns and in government itself. And like many disorders, chaos syndrome is self-reinforcing. It causes governmental dysfunction, which fuels public anger, that incites political disruption, which causes yet more governmental dysfunction. Raunch laments these political insurgents' lack of respect for the unwritten aspects of America's constitution. Conventions, as they're known in our system, their principles, frameworks, traditions, and norms, the beliefs and practices that we all accepted provided the framework for governance. They endured because they were respected and they were accepted as the rules of the game. So I find quite a lot of resonance actually in Raunch's analysis. I'm not suggesting in any way that Australia is at a comparable point, but political volatility and the policy instability that it engenders is a cause for significant concern. And so, frankly, is the flagrant disregard that some members of the political class show for the traditions and conventions of Westminster governance. 
Among a long list of possibilities, I include the Convention of Cabinet Confidentiality, Collective Responsibility, the Merit Principle, the Caretaker Conventions, and the Westminster tradition of treating the opposition as an executive in waiting and as part of the regime. The ongoing dispute between Attorney General George Brandis and the Solicitor General is merely the most recent example of the kind of executive overreach that has become commonplace in all of our jurisdictions. If I'd had more time, I'd have given you an example from all nine. Hyperpartisans, it seems, cannot resist the short-term tactical advantage, whatever the long-term costs. In their contribution to fixing the system, Wayne Arrington and Peter Van Onselen described this as ruling, not governing. I've watched the selective trashing of traditions and conventions at all levels of Australian government with increasing alarm. Is it willful or ignorant? It's hard to say. But I associate it with the rise of career politics, the demise of the parliamentary apprenticeship, um, and a more distant, less respectful relationship between political professionals and career officials. Rules matter. Institutions matter. American political scientist Hugh Hecklow defines institutional thinking in a book I think you should all read, in terms of his, this respect for the rules and traditions of something that is bigger than ourselves and will go on long after we're gone. Respect of, for traditions and conventions is what has enabled our system of government to evolve and adapt over time. And I argue the progressive but inexorable diminution of respect for the rules of the game accounts for the anxieties of Australian democracy that we are seeing expressed in recent elections. Peter Varghese, of course, emphasised the importance, but also the frailty of institutions in his valedictory speech. He reflected that institutions are fragile, living organisms, easily weakened and very hard to repair. Governments forget this to their nation's long-term peril. Arthur Tang said something eerily similar in his 1981 Gara narration. He urged reformers to focus on the total fabric and processes of government, including the role of ministers. Now, an expert professional and neutral career public service remains a defining feature of Westminster-style political systems. We know from history, from the searing experience of the past decade, and the worrying future that might await us, that if we don't, that if we don't act, how critical that stewardship role remains. But the research suggests there's no agreement um, on, about either what the stewardship role of the public service is, or what now constitutes a proper relationship between ministers and the public service. Rod Rhodes and I are just trying quite hard to finish a book on comparative central executives in Westminster systems. We're looking at the four Dominion countries and Queensland and Victoria, for people who are interested in a subnational comparison. That'll be published next year, I hope. Uh, and we identify five analytic themes that are common, that are common across the six uh, jurisdictions under study. I think only the fifth one of these will surprise you. These include, first, the problem of fragmentation and coordination that's arguably more acute at the subnational level because the states are responsible for service delivery. The second one is a tendency to play reactive politics um, and, and, and issues management, uh, which undermines coherence and efforts to focus on longer term priorities. The third one is the primacy of coping and survival in the calculus of political and administrative elites, the local paper test, whatever the career, the advertiser the advertiser test or the courier mail test, God forbid. A tendency, the fourth one is a tendency for a besieged leader to, to rely on a diminishing circle of ever closer advisors who by virtue of their close relationship with and loyalty to the leader are unable or unwilling to offer alternative advice. But the fifth one is the one that I think, you know, may shock you, that the courts around ministers in all the Westminster studies that we're, countries that we're looking at no longer regard the public service as central or even essential to decision making. Now each of these findings presents a challenge to Westminster norms, but none of them is really within the province of the public service to influence, except perhaps you know, in, through the relevance of advice. And so it's for this reason that I think we instead need to focus on politics, on considering whether and the ways by which the currently self-defeating model might be rehabilitated. Now, if that seems impossible or unlikely, I invite you to contemplate the alternative, a vicious cycle of poorly considered and badly executed policy that erodes trust in the ways that we've seen in the United States and in Europe. And in fact, Christine Wallace's essay in Fixing the System on Politics as Vocation challenges us all to stop being audience Democrats who are carp in from the sidelines, to embrace our civic responsibilities and to get involved. 
But if representative politics is a bridge too far, and I can well understand that hesitation, what about your professional association? Peter Varghese argues that the current challenge is comparable to post-war reconstruction, or the reform era of the 90s that George Meglaginas has documented so well. If that's so, what role are we each going to play? What vision or model are we working to develop through our shared commitment to good public administration in this country? How we work together, I think, across the scholarly and practice divide and with commentators and opinion leaders will, I think, be as critical now as it was in an earlier reform era. Now as then, IPA needs to be that platform. We need to find ways of extending that platform to politicians and advisors, in my view. Thank you. The stuff around the hybrid advisory model, um, how politicians are looking at uh, transforming the public service, and I think the thing that was the, the most kind of stark for me uh, was basically the public service really not having uh, much of a say um, in, in what was happening around them and, and uh, eroding uh, decision making. So where I'd like to start, I guess, is what can we do? I mean, given uh, there are a lot of us here, well, nearly everyone, uh, that works within this system, what can we do to build more trust in that public service decision making, which is actually critical? Um, and I'm particularly concerned about, I guess, the next 10 years, when you hear about what George is talking about, we need to have a neutral space to be talking about the things that we're probably uh, the most equipped to have some discussions about or we've had some experiences. So um, what are some practical things that we can do to actually start to build that trust? Well, I mean, I think I, I caught the end of the panel session with George and George said there's something about this new cadre of people who come to uh, the parliament or to ministerial office thinking that they're a sub subject matter expert. Um, that's a very new development, really, a comparatively recent development. So I have thought for a long time, and that's why I suggested that, you know, IPA really needs to be this platform as it was in the 70s, as it was in the 80s and 90s, when Eva Cox and John Patterson went toe-to-toe -to -toe at that terrifying encounter in Melbourne all those years ago. Um, it was the place where those debates happened, and there were many people participating in those debates. There was a cadre of journalists and academics who were very involved in that debate too, so it wasn't the public service carrying it alone. Uh, so I think there is a very important education role to play with uh, new MPs, with would-be representatives, but we don't engage with those groups um, from student politics or maybe where we should. Um, and we don't talk to them about organisational matters. They don't think organisationally, and you can see I deal with that in the, in the Fixing the System essay and in lots of other places. They don't think managerially. No. Because it was never supposed to, they weren't supposed to be managing bureaus. Those offices were supposed to be small, um, and it was never intended to be a long-term career. So we've, we've really got to, and in fact, David Epstein, one of the chiefs of staff in the, the chief of staff study that, uh, that we did, said it was really time to reopen the members of Parliament Staff Act debate in the Commonwealth and the debate that was had about, um, you know, partisan advisers and where they sit in the system. Great. You mentioned um, that the rules of the game um, uh, have changed mm. and uh, what I'd like you to do is just expand a bit about where you think um, uh, the most important parts of that, those rules of the game have changed for public servants. Look, I really think... Um, you know, I'm very interested in the loss of institutional memory and the loss of craft. Uh, if people saw that edition of um, AJPA that we did last January, that was, um, not January, 12 months, that was, you know, the thing that I'm very concerned about is who learns? I mean, who, who teaches you the rules of the game? Well, the rules of the game are taught through story, through apprenticeship, through um, opportunities to reflect. People are moving very quickly. People are, you know, in Queensland, for instance, um, there's a whole uh, cadre of people who for the last nine years um, have been socialised to a very blurred boundary between politics and administration, one that didn't exist in the same way, or one that existed, you know, for the 40 years before that, but then for 20 years didn't exist. Um, so I think, the, you know, I'm very concerned about socialisation around the apprenticeship. How do we deal with the shaky foundations of understanding a Westminster, which is the most overused term in, mm. you know, mm. the world? Um, and, you know, I always say Westminster, whatever they think that means. Because, of course, it is a very contested idea. But how do we orient people to 
when they see more senior people being sacked or being, you know, sent to a gulag or whatever, how, how do people make sense of that? Um, and I, I think academics have, we have really vacated the space in the last 20 years for, or 15 years for the reasons that we could talk about. Um, and I think, I think that we need to have academics much more engaged in those discussions with uh, reflecting on the experience of people who've been there, because the apprenticeship pathway just really doesn't exist anymore. Before I open up to the, um, to the audience, I think one of the challenges certainly that I've seen in terms of public sector reform is um, the ability for the public sector itself to actually show that it's able to be agile, and we talk about this a lot, uh, what does agile actually mean? Agile enough to actually shift itself, to actually um, challenge itself for uh, longer term um, outcomes, the things that the panel were talking about. It really is the space that we should be taking up. Uh, the person that talked about teaching in regional areas um, and data and, and working through, but what we don't do is actually use that holistically to actually then say, what does that mean for housing or how, what does it mean for domestic violence and how do we hook up? So the silos um, basically uh, still exist. Um, and in fact, I think it, that probably plays a lot to um, the, the sorts of uh, behaviours that you're talking about. So if we're tribal, um, uh, if you have, I guess, politicians being tribal, uh, you in effect get that, that sort of behaviour within agencies, which actually stops us from seeing the longer term. So. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, uh, my view would be sort of less about that um, and more that what stops you from analysing the data, from thinking more strategically, from doing long-term stuff? Well, my interview data tells me that it's because you're running around chasing issues that actually will not be relevant to anyone because nobody reads the advertiser or listens to talkback radio. A very small group of people do that. Yep. But still, that's what's driving the office, right? And it's what's driving the office because campaigning has become governing, but it's not, and it doesn't work, and this is why I can't understand why they can't learn, yeah. because it's so patently obvious if mm. you stand back. Um, and in the essay, I deal with the review for the Victorians in the room that David Kemp did of the mm. 2014 defeat, 163 pages that comes down to this, bad cabinet process, no transition planning, no policy, no agenda. Um, and that okay. you could make that argument about lots of people. Well, I believe the Premier's also arriving in a minute, so do we have a question from the audience? I do want one from the audience, so anyone have a particular question from, uh, in particular from what Anne has actually said? certainly resonated with me. No, they're all worried in case they're, they're worried asking now. That's when right. the Premier comes in. <laughs> there is one, okay. Hello, um, is this one? Yes. Harley Dennett from The Mandarin. I was wondering, Anne, if you could expand on the, uh, the policy expertise of ministers. Don't we vote in ministers, sorry, don't we vote in MPs on the basis of their, um, how good a candidate they are, um, such as their policy expertise? And if voters aren't picking them on, on that basis, uh, how do we choose our MPs? Well, we don't choose our MPs, the parties choose the MPs and I'd invite you to look at this, the composition of the Senate tickets from all of the jurisdictions in terms of policy expertise and I don't mean to cast aspersions on lots of very good people. I think there are actually some very talented people um, in the Parliament and I you know, would hope that many more would step up. But, it, but being in a Minister's office as a professional pathway or student politics to a Minister's office does not make you a policy expert about housing, about, uh, about any of these sorts of dimensions and I think that's where the confusion has come and it's about the demise of that pathway I think uh, from uh, which was the pathway for the ministerial staff pathway from the department to the office and back and we saw the diminution or the change and the real shift around that in 96 and really since then before then about 70% of the people in ministers offices had come from bureaucratic backgrounds this is something all the chiefs of staff talked about um, in the study that we'd had you know Arthur Sinodinas was really the last one to have bureaucratic experience and understanding of how to operate the machine, understanding what you can and can't influence, what you should and shouldn't try to influence from the office. Thank you. And on that note, the Premier has arrived. Excellent. Um, so please join me in thanking Anne for her speech. Thank you very much. Pleasure.